I think naturally it was something where better where better to try and uh, 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 explore his particular interest and you know that's the other thing you're only ever going to go to the moon once it, it's uh, it, at least walk on it there are a couple of astronauts who were fortunate actually to to go to the moon twice uh, but um, so y- y- you've You've got to be yourself in some respects. You're human, and you take your human traits along with you. I don't think there's any uh, dispute about that. And um, I, I just think sometimes it's, it's we slight we we make slightly too much of these things. I mean, you know, they they had an amazing experience, and I think for a lot of, a lot of us, if we had exactly the same experience, we would probably see see ourselves. And see the way that we perceived in a very different way, and I, perhaps that was perhaps that was hard to come to terms with. Yes, yes, I think so. I think I, I think you're quite right. I think Buzz uh, Buzz Aldrin may have uh, uh, had the, had the hardest time. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, it's a bit like you know, if you win, I don't know, Pop Idol X Factor or something. Suddenly, you're propelled from being totally unknown. Into millions, you know, hundreds of. I mean, at the time, the Apollo 11 landing, the television coverage, got had the highest viewing figures ever. So all of a sudden, you become instantly a household name. And again, I don't think that really entered into the day-to-day training when they were trying to to to, to grapple with the complexities of flying the lunar module. That was their job. That's what they had to do. But of course, it was inevitable that something as successful as landing on the moon and returning back safely to earth uh, is going to propel you and it's going to change your life the irony is it only lasted a couple of days and it was 40 years ago but it remains with them uh, uh, throughout the rest of their lives really something they have to live up to as Buzz said in the film interesting yes yes I I was a little surprised I mentioned this when you and I spoke the other day that uh, I was surprised during the uh, just one hour conversation. I know you spoke to the astronauts a lot longer than that, but the one hour I had with uh, with Buzz Aldrin is that he was still steaming mad over the selection process. He almost didn't get to the moon, even though he was uh, so well qualified, and he blamed it on being Air Force. That he was uh, one of the few eggheads. He was one of the few with a PhD. And he was uh, he was distrusted. He said all the others were Navy. He said to me, just count them, count the, the astronauts, where they were from, where the others were from. It was all Navy, 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 Navy. I was the only a- uh, Air Force, and they they left me out. They left me out on everything. It was only he only flew on the final Gemini flight, the one in which he earned his moniker of Doctor Rendezvous. Yeah. He only flew on that because of the death of the uh, the astronaut that was supposed to have been there. He was a replacement. And Sadly, when he, uh, that's that's right. That's and he right. got he got slipped in the last moment when he performed so well. That's the only thing that even got him into that flight in Apollo. So, but you'd think after being on that first landing on the moon and all that success, forty years later, uh, he would have let that go. But he's still steaming mad. Well, I think you have to look at it this way. You know, it took two it took two people to get down there. It took two people to get off again. It's as simple as that. And I think uh, you, 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 you can't really underestimate the the uh, intellect that uh, Buzz brought to that program because That's he, right. was, he right. was instrument in figuring out how to uh, achieve rendezvous in space, which was oh, oh, he did it manually yeah. in the in the final yeah. Gemini Gemini year ten. He the the uh, computer went out and he manually was able to fly the Gemini to its rendezvous with the Agena a target spacecraft. He did that on his own, just from his own knowledge in his head. Absolutely, and he was smart. You know, I mean, I, I don't think any other astronaut would argue that uh, argue that point. And if, he was also uh, the spacewalks that he conducted on that last Gemini mission were critical, absolutely critical. And he in, nailed in, it. He, he absolutely nailed it. It, it. Exactly, exactly. And you're always going, it's, it is unfortunate because, of course, unfortunately, I guess that's what people always say, you know, you were the second, but you know, only by a couple of minutes. And quite honestly, again, it's what we were talking about earlier. It's a team effort. They it's both a team ro- effort, but they he, both he still relied on each other. I know, to, I know, but get, he, he's still bothered by that. You know, he's still bothered uh, being second because uh, he well, complained. Well, I think, I think, I think what bothers him is uh, maybe more 
what bothers him is 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 not having the perhaps the recognition that he deserves and also of course it's one of those things i mean i can't speak for him obviously but but i i know that if i were in that position it would be a bit grating if all you ever hear is so you know you were the second rather than hey look amazing the work you did on um, orbital mechanics and uh, and, and rendezvous. That's Thank right. goodness you did that. Otherwise, actually... But he has to hear. I just heard it this morning on the radio where somebody uh, mentioned uh, the first landing on the moon. This was the... Uh, uh, and we're celebrating when Neil Armstrong took his first steps on the moon. No me- no mention of uh, Buzz Aldrin. No. But... And, uh, and, <laughs> and, 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 and also the protocol, his... Yeah. Uh, his uh, uh, commander status in the although he was second in command the normal status was that he would exit first he was certainly closer to the door the yes. normal protocol is he should have left first yes. and it was neil armstrong who told him not that long before the uh the actual apollo 11 flew that uh he armstrong was exercising his prerogative of the the highest ranking person on that mission and that he was going to leave for, he was going to squeeze around all, um, um, uh, Buzz Aldrin and uh, and exit first. And, uh, uh, and the rest is history. And the rest <laughs> is history. And the rest is, and, and who could blame him? I mean, Neil Armstrong, would you, you know, you and I may have done the same thing. Uh, even even uh, though Armstrong is, uh, has proven over time to be a uh, quiet, almost shy, reclusive, introverted person. He he, he didn't act that way then, and uh, who can blame him? You know, you get one shot at being the first person uh, the, uh, to land, uh, to step on the moon. No other person will ever be able to say that, and uh, who among us would not take that opportunity? And meantime, we're talking about the first people on the moon, and we are happen to be uh, looking almost right at it, even though the moon is fully in eclipse. We can still see those solidified lava blotches very easily, and there is the landing site of Apollo 11. Go up from the center of the moon, go up in approximately a 1 o'clock direction, uh, go about halfway from the center of the moon to the edge, and you will be at the Sea of Tranquility site where the first uh, astronauts landed. Interestingly enough, the place where the final astronauts landed, Apollo 17, is right near there, too. It's right near the spot where those two large blotches on the upper right to the upper right of center, where they come together, is uh, just about the spot where Apollo 17 uh, landed on the moon. So we we, we get a two-for-one. Actually, we get an all-of-them-for-one because all the astronauts landed on this part of the moon that faces us, the near side of the moon, and they all landed uh, in a place uh, uh, between the center and about halfway to the edge. None of them landed along the limb or along the edge of the moon. So we were actually all at once taking in the entire uh, field of all the uh, uh, landings on the all six places where the Apollos landed uh, on the moon. It should be mentioned that the uh, a lot of people think that there's a dark side to the moon and a permanent dark side but of course there is not there is a near side one side always faces earth and there's a permanent far side but all parts of the moon get night and uh, day in about uh, two week uh, increments now Duncan uh, even though we had scheduled you for an hour I wonder if you'd be kind enough to stay with us after the break maybe stay for another 15 minutes could you do that yeah, no, I can stay as long as you want. I'm, I'm enjoying it very much. Thank you. Okay, well, then, very good. We're going to do that uh, soon. We are approaching the midpoint of the eclipse here. And we, of course, want to thank Google and SLU for making this possible. And uh, the coverage of the moon with our desk, guest, Duncan Kopp. We're going to have another de- guest soon uh, as well. I'm Bob Berman. And it's uh, thanks to uh, Paramount and Google and SLU, S-L-O-O-H, for making this live coverage of the lunar eclipse possible. So um, we will be taking a station ID break, very uh, brief one, and then we'll be back after just a few seconds. So stay with us for continuing coverage of the live lunar eclipse.
You're listening to SLU Space Camera's live total lunar eclipse, powered by WSRadio.com, the worldwide leader in Internet talk. Okay, we're back covering the live lunar eclipse. We have uh, people, tech people around the world, South Africa, Dubai, Cyprus, monitoring the eclipse. Uh, we're going to reach the midpoint of the eclipse, which is a special moment. Actually, in solar eclipses, it's a very special moment, but in a lunar eclipse, which unfolds kind of in slow motion, it's special because we're going to be able to inspect the moon for any asymmetries which reveal odd things happening on Earth. This is the only occasion when we can look at a celestial object in space and get a report card about our own conditions here on Earth, our environmental uh, atmospheric conditions, and we'll be able to really assess that coming up um, uh, at mid-eclipse, which is only another uh, 10 or 11 minutes from now. We have Duncan Kopp as our guest. A little bit later on, we're going to have uh, Lucy Green. These are astronomers from England. I'm Bob Berman of Astronomy Magazine and the Old Farmer's Almanac. And since I have no shame, I will plug my new upcoming book called The Sun's Heartbeat. will be published next month by... Little Brown. And uh, that's it. Hi, Duncan. We're back. Hello there. So, uh, a nice eclipse, isn't it? Yeah, it's beautiful. I'm just uh, looking at it with, with the SLU camera here online. It looks fantastic. Where's that feed coming from? Uh, well, we have Dubai. I think the current feed that we're looking at is uh, Dubai. We have Matt and Paul and uh, the SLU techies. Normally SLU, uh, we have a giant half-meter telescope set up in on the Canary Islands, and uh, anyone who signs up to become a member controls it from their own uh, computer. You press a button, and boom, the computer moves, and every five minutes, there's a different object in full color live happening. For example, there's a supernova going off in the Whirlpool Galaxy. We're going to be looking at that tonight at SLU. Just amazing amazing celestial objects. What kind of a world is this where from your own chair sitting in front of your computer in your underwear, you can make a, <laughs> a telescope on the other side of the world, change your direction and point to any celestial object you like. For example, last year we were really mesmerized by Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter's going to be out again very soon. It's been behind the sun the last few months, but uh, Jupiter lost one of its two main belts. Uh, anybody with even a, almost a toy telescope knows that uh, the most prominent features on Jupiter are the northern and southern equatorial belts. Well, the southern one just went boom and vanished, and it was gone all last year. We watched the red spots swirling around, its moons going around and cast its shadow, and all, all of it changing before our eyes and being live. So it's very exciting. Uh, I have to uh, tell you, I don't... Uh, get paid any extra for raving about SLU, but it, it's hard not to. Because, it's great. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm totally new to SLU, uh, 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 but it sounds like a fantastic idea. And I, I guess the real advantage is if you live in a city and you've got all that urban light pollution and you want to try and capture something, you, you want to go and see something that you know that's happening, I assume then SLU is the place to go. Yes, or if you want to just augment, supplement your astronomy uh, hobby, even if you live in dark um, locations, it's no okay. secret that even the largest backyard telescope only shows galaxies and nebulae in black and white. And that's because at low light levels, our eyes switch to their so-called scotopic vision, and uh, which is always uh, black and white. Here's something a lot of people don't know, that in faint light, our best vision is 2200. In other words, we're legally blind. Wow. You can prove that for yourself tonight. Just turn the lights off in your bedroom, and if mm -hmm. all you have is a little night light or maybe a little light coming up uh, through the window under a curtain, look around and all the detail you might have seen on the floor, whether you have a carpet and could have seen every little thread in the carpet or a wood floor, you see the grains in the wood when the lights are bright. Now in dim light, once your eyes get used to the dim light, which takes a few minutes, but once they do, suddenly everything is very blurry because your vision is 2200 in faint light. So using a backyard telescope, even the most expensive backyard telescope, galaxies are still very faint. Their surface brightness is still so low 